Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Growing more with less is the mantra of Nebraska's corn farmers, and they're using incredible technology to do it. Soil moisture monitors let them know when their crop needs water and how much. GPS systems eliminate overlaps in the field, saving fuel and money. New hybrids reduce the use of pesticides and increase yields. When you're talking new technology and innovation, Nebraska corn farmers are all ears. Nebraska's Family Corn Farmers, sustaining innovation. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Luke Beckman analyzes the USDA's July crop report. Elwin Taylor discusses weather's impact over the rest of the growing season. Bob Klein talks about weed control after winter wheat harvest. And Jason Norsworthy explains how growers can manage resistant Palmer amaranth. Luke Beckman from Central Valley Ag is our corn and soybean market analyst this week. The USDA is forecasting larger crops this harvest, not because of bigger yields, but due to more harvested acres. The agency's July crop report released Tuesday raised corn production 110 million bushels to a record 14.5 billion and increased U.S. soybean output 80 million bushels. In South America, the USDA lowered 2015-2016 corn production 7.5 million metric tons and lowered 2016-2017's 2 million. Across the U.S., corn and soybeans are not only holding in, the percentage of the crops in good to excellent increased over the past week. But markets have now shifted their attention to the possibility of hot weather. We talked with Luke Wednesday afternoon in Shelby, Nebraska, and started by looking at the stocks numbers from Tuesday's report. It was a big surprise a little bit, Jeff. The market didn't react much, but really expected old crop stocks to increase. Uh, and that came from that quarterly stocks number where we had a lot more corn sitting around than what we thought. Uh, so it was the expectation that we would see feed demand come down a lot uh, in, these, in this week's numbers. That really wasn't the case. USDA elected to uh, not adjust that number as much as what we thought, down just 50 million bushels. Um, and then uh, ethanol came down just a shade as well. Exports are really saving the day. That all goes back to what happened in Brazil earlier this spring. U.S. exports continue to uh, go up on old crop as well as the new crop book. Describe what the USDA is expecting for the current crop that's in the field. Uh, really, you go back to what they have as their condition ratings. They ticked up uh, a percentage again this week, 76% good to excellent. A lot of people questioning that. Is that real? You know, that is their perception today at least. So you'd have to expect that the 168 we have on the balance sheet today uh, goes up in August. Now those things are changing here this week as we see a hot and dry forecast in front of us. Was it a surprise at all that they didn't touch yield? Not usually. I mean, you're not going to see uh, the July yield really tampered with. Uh, very rarely does the USDA mess with that. I think 2012 was an exception when we were exceptionally dry. Uh, but usually those adjustments take place in August. Describe what the current crop looks like in Nebraska, sort of the year, uh, area that you guys cover. Sure, within the CVA footprint, I mean, really things overall look pretty good. Uh, it's not been a year without its challenges, but uh, for the most part, the crop is in good shape today. We talked about Brazil months ago and whether or not that crop was in trouble. The USDA and their thoughts and CONAB's thoughts in Brazil, what implications do they have on U.S. producers here? Yeah, Jeff, I mean, you mentioned it. That second crop corn that they have over there really continues to get smaller. As that happens, Brazil does not have the carryout available uh, to really provide any kind of cushion for that. Uh, their exports this year will be about half of what they were the year prior. Uh, so that business is going somewhere else. Uh, the U.S. is in line to gain from that, both within this old crop marketing year and additionally within the new crop ranks as well. There's probably more there 
in the new crop side. I think we can expect that as we get into the next several months, into the winter, depending on how that is progressing. We probably see export man continue to go up. Yeah, that's a question. It can last for a few months here? Absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, the reality is that that crop's not there in Brazil. That problem will not have an opportunity to be fixed until they get into their next production cycle, which is a year from now when we kind of see what their second crop looks like. Back in this area of Nebraska, how do you expect basis will move here as farmers start to think about cleaning out bins for the 2016 harvest? That's just it, Jeff. It's really about cleaning out and getting ready for harvest. Price obviously dictates a lot of that. If we're going to stay low down here, uh, basis probably firms to try to get that grain moving. But in due time, it's going to move anyway. Um, so really with basis firming, uh, in the last 10 days or so. It's a good opportunity for producers to at least manage that portion of their risk uh, and probably lay off some basis risk on old crop inventory that they have. We saw a good close to the market today on Wednesday. What are your expectations about where this market can move? Uh, tell me what the 8 to 14 day forecast looks like and that'll provide the direction. Uh, it is really all about weather right now. Uh, the beans certainly more impacted than corn. We saw what a changing weather forecast can do to the corn market though. Uh, if those maps start to change for beans, I think there is weather premium built in today and it can come out pretty quickly too. So uh, it's a weather market. We need to uh, have some targets in place, I think, incrementally to take advantage of it because it can evaporate pretty quickly. How volatile are both corn and soybeans because of weather? So tremendously. I mean, the, the soybean trade um, moving 30 cents a day is absolutely about weather. If you look at the balance sheet today, Jeff, a two bushel swing in that national yield does tremendous things to the carryout. That's the difference between sub 200 and plus 400 million bushels for next year's carryout. The USDA says the U.S. just experienced its warmest June on record with data dating back to 1895. Nebraska and Iowa each saw average temperatures that ranked in their top 10 for the month, but Nebraska's June was also its 12th driest. The latest U.S. drought monitor shows 6% of its defined Midwest region in moderate drought, while Nebraska carries only 2% in those D1 conditions. At Nebraska Extension's Crop Management Diagnostic Clinic on Wednesday, we talked with Iowa State's Elwyn Taylor to learn how weather could impact crops throughout the rest of the year and recap how it's affected corn and soybeans so far this growing season. The weather's been great for the crops. People have wondered about it, but it's been almost ideal. In fact, to be too hot, it has to go over 93, and it usually takes two or three days in a row before it hurts anything. Hot weather, the plants use more water. We started off with the soils loaded with water, so we haven't been too dependent on rain, and places with irrigation have been able to keep up with it just fine. What do you expect for the national yields this year? We anticipate that the yield will come out uh, two, maybe three bushels above the trend line for corn, one and a half above trend for the soybean. That is if the weather continues through August as favorable as it has been getting well into July. Are there specific areas of the country that are doing well? Are there specific areas of the country that aren't doing so well? Pretty much the Corn Belt is in good condition and there are some exceptions but very few exceptions that are more than a county or two in size, so it won't affect the national yield much. It'll have impact locally. Going back to the beginning of the season, you discussed what El Nino would mean for the growing season. Tell me why El Nino has such an impact uh, on the Midwest and crop growers here. Well, it was a long time before people figured out just how the El Nino works in the Midwest. And the way it works is cutting off the extremes, not oppressively hot during an El Nino year, not amazingly dry, but closer to the average. Well, average is perfect in the Midwest for corn and soybean. It's almost like it was made to do it. So the closer to average we are, the better we are. A La Nino year gets more extreme. It can be extremely wet or extremely dry, but even worse, extremely hot. And of course, the heat can be the big factor and in reality, the temperature is a bigger factor than the precipitation variability all the way across the Corn Belt. If the yields are good, what do you and the team at Iowa State expect for prices during the season, during the harvest season? We think that the price is going to be lower than most people uh, wish it would be. Got an above trend line yield or even 5% below still isn't going to put corn up in the $4 range at harvest time when we're looking at the Chicago December prices. So if we talk about the national yield being above trend line, how would La Nina come into play? 
if La Nina should develop, then La Nina could influence the beans. But July is the month for the corn, and even if La Nina showed up immediately, pretty much we're through July. That is the month that is most important to the corn and its yield, and we would then still be saying trend line or better. Nevertheless, the soybean could be impacted. Do we expect a La Nina that would affect the soybean? No. I should ask, do you expect a La Nina at all? I don't have an expectation when we look toward a year from now. But uh, to make it in time for this crop season to be a problem in the Corn Belt, I think that we're almost past the time that La Nina would be a threat. When will you know uh, if El Nino is going to transition into La Nina? We already know that El Nino is essentially gone. And will it transition into La Nina? Usually takes about another 30 days to see if it's going to do it or not. And then it takes another 30 days until the effect gets from the equator to Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois, and it almost never gets to Indiana anyway. How do you believe volatility from the climate will impact crop growers over the next few years? Volatility is increasing, and it's uh, not because of man-made climate change. It's just time for volatility to increase. It goes through a cycle, and we're moving into the cycle of more volatile uh, weather. It's a 25-year period of time of volatility. Our past 20 years have been really mild weather compared to the previous 25. Tell me why there's this cycle of volatility. We don't know why it's there, but we know it's been there for 400 years, looking at tree rings and then looking at the crops. We've kept records since the 1860s. It is a very consistent cycle. Does that go with temperature and precipitation? It goes with how the plants do. And we're not sure of what it has meant in the specific things of temperature or precipitation, because they're so connected. It could be either one, or both working together. So what do crop growers do to help try to manage through that variability? Uh, the best way to handle the variability is first uh, use good practice in your agriculture. Uh, in places where you can irrigate, be ready to do so uh, as appropriate. But in places without irrigation, have good insurance and a good marketing plan. Later in the show, Al will give his forecast for heat and rain chances during the coming week in Nebraska. The July Nebraska farmer says with volatile milk prices, keeping costs down and turning challenges into valuable resources are keys to staying in the dairy business. This month's magazine says that's a big part of how Warren Snodgrass at O&W Dairy operates, along with his wife Mary, son Roy, and grandsons Heath and Seth. Looking to expand their dairy herd from 700 to 850 cows, they found ways to handle their manure waste as a positive rather than a negative. You can read about how the Snodgrasses are making the most of this valuable resource in the July Nebraska Farmer. Nebraska's winter wheat farmers have harvested 38% of this year's crop, a jump of 18 points from a week ago and four points ahead of the state's five-year average. At a recent field day, we talked with Nebraska Extension's Bob Klein to discuss the importance of weed control after harvest, including in fields with resistance or damage from recent storms. One of the things is, if you happen to have a hailstorm and you get that early volunteer, that's the one that really bridges the gap and becomes a problem next year for wheat streak mosaic disease. And we've seen some big losses in that. I remember in the Ogallala area a few years ago, where the farmer didn't control his volunteer wheat that had been hailed on earlier. And that field, the adjoining farmer field, made about five or six bushel. And the rest of the farmer's fields that were not in that area were making 60 bushel plus. So it can really be devastating. Is there a specific control option you'd recommend for controlling uh, volunteer wheat? Well, one of the things is the glyphosates really do a good job. And that's a low cost treatment. Now, usually when we're talking about weed control during the, in the growing wheat uh, in the next, for fallow the next year, or in most cases it's going to corn or grain sorghum or sunflowers or some other crop. It can't even be proso millet or whatever it happens to be. But we want to control those weeds and volunteer wheat so they don't use moisture and the weeds go in the seed, which make it real difficult to control in the next crop. Now what we try to use is we use a split or split treatments. We usually go in shortly after wheat harvest. 
when we get that first flush or the volunteer wheat comes and then spray some glyphosate and in many cases we're going to add some 2,4-D or Banville to make sure in case we have glyphosate resistant kosher, glyphosate resistant weeds out there that we get that covered too. Yeah, can you expand more on the resistance issues that you're noticing in your part of the state? Yeah, one of the big things in western Nebraska is the kosher problem. Now the thing is on kosher, you can be doing a great job but somebody north of you 20 or 30 miles with the winds that we have out in western Nebraska, and that kosher will blow for miles and miles, along with other weeds like Russian thistle that are also glyphosate resistant, can be big problems and so forth. So we really got to make sure that we try to do the entire community of controlling some of those weeds that really helps from going to seed and so forth. What's the time frame that you like to get these weeds controlled in? Okay, it depends so much too about how much pressure you have out there. Uh, if you really had a dense canopy in the winter wheat and it didn't get hailed on, lots of times you can wait a little bit longer. In most cases, you'll be talking about anyway from about two weeks after harvest to about a month. Usually you want to get that uh, first treatment on within that period of time. Then we're going to come back later in September and apply the residual. If we know we're going to corn or grain sorghum, well, that treatment will include some atrazine. And that's really been good to keep down the volunteer wheat and the downy brome and some of those other grassy wheats like that and even help with the broadleaf weeds. U.S. winter wheat growers are producing a crop expected to break the national record for average yield with prices around their current levels. Nebraska Extension Public Policy Specialist Brad Lumen says farmers need to be aware of loan deficiency payments for the first time in more than a decade. Brad recently wrote a Crop Watch article explaining the logistics of the program. We'll link to that on the Market Journal homepage. Palmer amaranth is one of three weeds to have developed resistance against multiple herbicides in Nebraska. Researchers confirmed its resistance to atrazine and HPPD inhibitors in a south-central Nebraska cornfield in 2013. They confirmed its resistance to glyphosate in the state last year. This week, Nebraska Extension held a field day sponsored by the Nebraska Corn Board aimed specifically at managing resistant Palmer amaranth. As you'll hear in our interview with University of Arkansas's Jason Norsworthy, who spoke at the event, Palmer amaranth is a fast-growing weed that can produce up to a million seeds per plant. For crop producers across the country, it's made the overall resistance battle much more difficult. Basically, resistance happens from just the repeated use of any particular strategy. And as I spoke today, it's, it doesn't really matter if it's a herbicide or even gave an example today of even resistance to hand weeding. Going out and doing the same strategy year after year is ultimately going to lead to resistance. But in the context of most of the crops, corn, soybean that we're dealing here today, it's generally the repeated use of a herbicide year after year until that herbicide is no longer uh, functioning or working. How do you tell if you have resistance or a weed resistant to something in your field? You know, when you have a weed population and you've killed every weed in the field except for one particular weed, that's a good indication that you have a resistance. If you have a small patch of weeds and over time that small patch is growing, uh, you probably have resistance. If you go to a field and you have, today we talked about Palmer amaranth, if you have Palmer amaranth or a pigweed, for instance, and you have dead plants and live plants right beside each other, it's a very good indication that you have resistance. And at that point, we really need to do something to get in on uh, in front of that and make sure that we don't have further spread of that resistance. Describe for me the problems that U.S. farmers are facing with Palmer amaranth. You know, Palmer amaranth has spread. 2005, it was found in Georgia. We found it in, uh, in Arkansas in 2006. Today, Palmer amaranth is found in 30 states across the U.S. Glyphosate resistant Palmer amaranth is actually found in 30 states. And, and glyphosate or Roundup was uh, the, was the uh, most effective herbicide that really we've ever seen and I contend we'll ever see probably in our lifetime. And it's, it's really unfortunate there's vast acres today. There's estimates that we're probably talking upwards of 70 uh, to 80 million acres of cropland in the U.S. today that are infested by glyphosate 
resistant uh, weeds, not necessarily Palmer amaranth, but Palmer amaranth in itself is spreading. And we talked today about uh, the spread, you know, combines, as individuals come south and they buy a, a combine, it moves north. We talked about cotton seed holes and individuals buying again products out of, out of the south. Uh, this is a weed that really is a desert-like uh, plant. It thrives under hot, dry conditions, but it also does quite well on these very fertile uh, soils up here in Nebraska and elsewhere. In the scope of difficulty, tell me how much more difficult it is for farmers to maintain positive yields with Palmer amaranth resistant to certain chemicals. You know, Palmer amaranth, once you lose options in terms of control, you can quickly lose uh, lose effectiveness of anything that you have in that field. You just get overpowered from a numbers game. And what we've seen is uh, Palmer amaranth, just complete crop loss in cases where you have resistance and you have no other options that you can go into that field. And, and I know in the Mid-South, we have individuals that are no longer farming today. They've ultimately lost the farm as a result of Palmer amaranth and uh, the fact they weren't able to maintain high yields but I've seen I've seen vast acres where individuals will go from 50 bushel 60 bushel beans down to 10 15 bushel beans uh, in areas where Palmer amaranth just basically overpowered the, the crop and you're talking about a plant that uh, generally speaking is going to produce 60,000 100,000 seed but on these edges of the fields uh, can produce upwards of a million seed and with that you just begin to overpower the crop and not only the these overpowering mainly due to the fact that, as I mentioned today, you've got a plant that grows uh, two, two and a half inches per day. Once it gets up to about four to five inches, it really takes off in terms of growth. And at that point, there are no chemical options in terms of removing it from a field. So what's the solution now? What do farmers do? Solution now is, is try to get in front of it. And there, there is not a lot of acres infested. For instance, Palmer amaranth, not a lot of acres infested in the state of Nebraska. If you find Palmer amaranth on your farm today, we talked today about a zero tolerance uh, threshold. I'd make every effort possible to ensure that I don't have I don't have seed production. If you do have some infestations on there, make everything uh, take every step possible to ensure that those plants do not produce seed. Is it going to cost some money? Absolutely, it will cost money today. But I can assure you, in the long run, it's going to pay for itself because you're going to have some herbicides that are still going to work several years from now versus losing one herbicide after another. We talked about the resistance treadmill. As you go through these herbicides, we're quickly approaching the day where these guys are not going to have any options on, on weeds like Palmer amaranth. Reinforce to me in the end how important it is that farmers realize the importance of different modes of action. You know, I think that's something that uh, farmers at times really struggle with. It's not only realizing different modes of action, but effective modes of action and you can go to a field and you can actually have two modes of action in that field but for instance I gave today the example if I have a glyphosate resistant Palmer amaranth and we bring in another herbicide that's effective that's only one effective mode of action if you already have glyphosate resistance growers have got to understand if they have weeds in their field which every grower does what potential herbicides to which those weeds are resistant? Because otherwise you will not be able to get multiple effective modes of action on the acre. And not only getting multiple effective modes of action, as I indicated today, we really prefer to see two effective modes of action in a tank together. And the reason being is if we have an escape within that field, we can control it with the second mode of action. Otherwise, that plant is going to survive. If that plant survives, by the time you come back in with a sequential application, it will be too large, you will not be able to effectively control it, and you will quickly go through modes of action. So we've got to understand we need two effect, at least two effective modes of action on that acre, and you've got to understand what works and what does not work when it comes to resistance management. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we again for the weekly forecast. Of course, as most people have kind of come to realize, we are looking at a very hot period coming up over this next seven day period during this last week. We've been seeing a mixed mode. We had a couple cold fronts move through the state that did touch off some scattered thunderstorm activity. The most concentrated areas of precipitation were right along uh, the Missouri River Basin, basically from just north of Omaha down to uh, essentially the southeastern corner. And then right along the Kansas-Nebraska border, several waves moved most of the heavy precipitation just to our south through Kansas. Uh, as we've gone through the, to the end of the week, of course, we've been dealing with a little bit more in the increase of scattered convection. And we'll probably deal with that through the remainder of this weekend before before the furnace or blast furnace, I should say, turns up in earnest and we start to deal with a return to upper 90s to most likely low 100s, the big question is how long will it last? 
and will we receive any precipitation during this uh, impending heat wave? So let's get a look right to the models and see what's going on. First of all, we do have a ridge to the southwest. This is our, play, our, our maker of our weather as we go through next week. But on the top of this ridge, we do see a no slight northwest flow. So we have one piece of energy moving through the state right now. We expect to see some scattered thunderstorm activity, particularly over the eastern half of the state. Um, anything that gets developed is likely to reach severe limits in some of the isolated locations. And then as we go into tomorrow, what we end up noticing is that ridge kind of pushes a little bit farther to the north and we see another piece of energy moving along the periphery of that ridge so the best locations for precipitation as we go into tomorrow will be the northern half of the state and then extreme eastern Nebraska as we get a little bit of that moisture from the Gulf moving up into the region. Now as we go into Monday we start to see that ridge pushing more toward our north and our east takes most of the active weather up over the Great Lakes region and we start to see subsiding air into our region indicated by the blues here and we'll start to crank the heat up. So we'll see temperatures jumping up into the low mid 90s as we get into Monday but more importantly as we get into Tuesday we start to see this ridge taking over the central plains. There is one piece of energy that's noted by the models that potentially could come out a Tuesday afternoon and impact western Nebraska. If it does we'd be see some elevated convection and some severe weather but overall we'd be looking at a widespread upper 90s to low 100s and in fact the best areas for 100 degree weather will be the western half of the state and as we go into Wednesday we may actually see some areas of the state touching that 105 to 107 range particularly as we get into north central Nebraska. Ridge dominates most of the energy stays up into the Dakotas and then rise around the front ridge and might come down into the eastern Corn Belt but overall we're looking at a second consecutive day of very hot conditions with some very high dew points so the cattle stress could get really outrageous on Wednesday. Now as we go into Thursday Thursday, we do see some trends uh, in the models indicating that potentially this ridge will start to break down slightly, but we are still going to be looking at upper 90s to low 100s. And as we get into Friday, now the ridge starts to flatten and we start to see some of that energy moving into the Rocky Mountains, so we may see some scattered thunderstorms develop late in the period. And particularly as we get into next weekend, we may actually see some more scattered convection. The 8 to 14 day forecast indicates the heat will stay in place basically from next Thursday to the following Tuesday. There is some questions concerning the precipitation, but right now the, the consensus of the models is drier than normal conditions. The western half of the state has the best opportunity for precipitation. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews are available individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on the USDA's July crop report, the weather outlook for the rest of the growing season, weed control after wheat harvest, and management of resistant Palmer amaranth. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Next week, we'll report from Western Nebraska. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.